Hello and welcome to the Pastor Well Podcast. I'm Herschel York, Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and pastor of the Buck Run Baptist Church in Frankfurt. The Pastor Well Podcast is dedicated to helping servants of the Lord Jesus Christ be faithful in ministry. We do that by conversation, by asking questions, by having folks we like to talk to. Mm. And today I've got one I really like to talk to. This is uh, Dr. Clint Presley. Actually, not, not doctor not yet. Not doctor yet. Yeah. Working on it. Yeah. We, we, we will get into that. But uh, <laughs> Clint is pastor of the Hickory Grove Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a uh, man of many, many talents. Uh, huh. So welcome to Pastor Well. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, um, I'm glad you are here. How long have you been at, at Hickory Grove? Uh, next month makes 10 years. Tell us about the church. Hickory Grove, uh, established in 1955, uh, was a pretty... Regular church up until about 1984, when it really started to grow, grew exponentially through sort of the modern church growth movement at the time from the 80s and 90s. And then in 2010, when I came, uh, the pastor that was there during all the growth, he retired. I became the pastor. And uh, you have like one campus? We actually have two campuses. Uh, We bought some property in 1995 which is pretty early on in uh, sort of the different campus model. I think that it probably was bought to move out there, but never did get around to it. Uh So it established two two locations with no intention of going for a third. Like we won't go to a genuine multi-campus model. Okay. So how how does the second campus work? Uh, You have – a campus pastor or do you have video? What, how do you do it? No, we don't use video. Uh, we do have a campus pastor there, but he does lots of the administration. Uh, that campus has a full staff like any other congregation would. The two really uh, work as almost almost twin sisters with staff and um, with all that goes with the church. That campus pastor <clears throat> preaches there? He preaches there once a month. So once a month, I'll stay all day uh, at one place and the campus pastor say at our north campus, we'll preach there. And then uh, the following Sunday, I would stay all day at north, and then the main campus pastor would preach there. Otherwise, I'll preach at both places. You do. You, so mm-hmm. how, how long does it take you to travel between them? It's a 20-minute ride. Yeah. yeah. I did that for several years myself, and uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a, a fun to it, you know? Yeah. It, but uh, you, you, your, your face is looking well, like my you don't first, think it's fun. My first five years, uh, I had to preach five times every Sunday morning. Oh. going back and forth. So I had three services at one and two at the other. And that got pretty close to being yeah, like work. I, I can't, I, that was not a good way I, to I've church. done that one time in my life. I preached five <clears throat> times in Korea, one of those yeah, massive yeah, churches yeah. in Korea. Was, and by by the, really by the third time, I'm going, did I already say that? <laughs> you know, well, that's why I ended up uh, started. That's why I use a manuscript today uh, was because I would get in the fourth sermon. I didn't know if I had said this or not. So, uh, uh, about how many folks come to Hickory Grove? Uh, it's about 3,000 or so, uh, give or take, you know, 500. Yeah. Now, have you pastored a small church? My first two churches were small churches. I started uh, preaching um, when I was 23, just gotten married, uh, pastored a small church in Mississippi, then pastored another small church in Mississippi. So my first seven and a half, eight years of ministry— I never preached to more than 100 people. What do you think is harder, pastor in a small church, pastor in a large church? I think it's going to depend largely on the church. <coughs> mm-hmm. uh, but I would say a large church carries with it a, a lot of sort of constant weight. There's not very much break. You know, my take on it, of course, I've, never, uh, I've not pastored like a, a church as large as yours. My uh, One of my very closest friends pastors a mega, mega Mm-hmm. Uh, and down in Brazil, 28 campuses. Goodness gracious. Uh, uh, I don't know, 11, 12,000 at the main campus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm heavily involved there, uh, preach down there frequently, and I know the, the burden that he has. But there's a certain there's a certain point at which a, a large church goes almost of its own momentum. I mean, That's the true. rhythms of yeah. it. And the difficulty of a small church, I think, is that uh, like if you get one family ticked at you in a small church. Yeah, you got trouble. You feel it, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. all they got to do is influence <clears throat> two, three other families. That's true. You're in a huge problem. Mm-hmm. In a large church, that's just 
really can't happen. They That's just true. Don't, they don't have an avenue to have that kind of a voice. Yeah, it's much easier to go and speak to 100 deacons uh, than it is to speak to six deacons. Yeah. Because the six deacons, all of them want to say something and voice an opinion. Usually in a room of 100 deacons, yeah. nobody says anything. Yeah, that – that. Uh, so the uh, the the challenges are different. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're and some of this is a fit with your personality. That's true. Yeah. So uh, I see you as uh, first of all you you're an extrovert. Is that correct? That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, and you're, you're I, I never see you do anything halfway. Is that right? Yeah. And hmm. I, this is something I admire about you. It's huh. sort of the opposite of me. I'm. I'm an introvert. <clears throat> Are you really? Oh, I, I am. I have to. Uh, I wonder why you're always running away from me. Yeah. And, well, uh, I'm afraid you're going to slap me on the back, you know. Uh, <clears throat> you, know, you you are a, an incredible people person. Hmm. And uh, you you have the, the same, to me, you have the same demeanor in the pulpit as you do hmm. in the hallway. And, I, again, I see this as I a strength. That. But m- That's all the kind. M- more than anything, you know, the Lord uses – all, all different kinds of, kinds of right. personalities, right? But that's yours, and I think you mm-hmm. you really uh, capitalize on it extremely well. well. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, well, I mean it as a high compliment Thanks. because I, I admire you greatly, hmm. uh, and you are you're involved in a lot of things. So you did your you did your MDiv at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Yeah, I actually started at Southwestern when what did I you? when I graduated college and wanted to go to seminary. At the time, uh, the seminaries were going through turmoil, and really, uh, the pastor said, look, you need to go to Southwestern. So I went out there and started at Southwestern uh, and my, met my wife there. She graduated Southwestern. Uh, she was a year and a half ahead of me. And then once she graduated, I wanted to preach. So I quit school, <clears throat> laid it down, went and started pastoring a church in Mississippi. Pretty quickly, uh, I knew I loved Jesus, I loved the Bible, I loved people. I just didn't know how to get them all together. Mm-hmm. And so I um, immediately started back to seminary going to New Orleans. And I would drive down. Back then, there's no online. So just drive down the campus, 140 miles, go to class, drive home every day. By the way, you're in great company of, of great preachers who did exactly that. Really? Adrian Rogers, Jerry oh. Vines. Uh, they— they were guys that pastored and drove a long way mm. to go to New Orleans Seminary mm. and study there while they were pastoring in the field. I've heard them tell almost really? an identical yeah. story. Yeah, we're out a bunch of cars, always stayed broke. Uh, took three years, but got it done, and uh, very glad of it. Uh, and now you are still a student. <laughs> You're working on a doctor of ministry. <laughs> That's right, at Southern Seminary. At the Southern Baptist uh, Seminary, right. yes, sir. as Thank we you. like to say. Right. Uh, people think we're making that up, but it really is. It is. That's the name. Right. It is capital T, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are you doing your d in? Doing it in uh, expository preaching uh, and leadership. So using the pulpit to lead change uh, at a church like ours. Well, that's a great topic, one that I believe in very, very much. Mm-hmm. So what's your, what is your project you're doing? Well, I'm uh, hopefully going to use what... Uh, we've done some of the things we've done to provide sort of theological, doctrinal, devotional change uh, at a church like Hickory Grove. Church uh, Hickory Grove was and is sort of the classic model of a mega church as defined mm-hmm. in the Southern Baptist Convention. How it got there was a typical means that everybody used to get there. And then, so we're on the back side of that. What do you now do? Now what? Now with all of this. Yeah, and especially since everything is in decline. Everything is in decline. Everything. So, you know, I so don't what downtown do we church, do? urban church, suburban church. What, what do we do? And yeah. uh, I think it starts in the worship center at the pulpit. Uh, well, uh, tell me your, how do you use the pulpit for leadership? Yeah, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that uh, yeah, you... Uh, you do um, leadership, you do discipleship, you do m- motivation, you'll do uh, tone change, you do culture adjustment. Uh, all goes on in in the worship center. Absolutely. It has a start there. It absolutely And I does. think that uh, we underestimate the, the discipleship element of what happens on a Sunday morning at church. And I think we've tried to re-engage that in our, uh, in our worship services at Hickory Grove. So tell me how you how you preach. Uh, like, 
do you preach series? Do you preach your books? What do you do? Yeah, our church was not accustomed to uh, any sort of long-term exposition, so I had to ease the church into that. I was started with Year of the Bible, preached, so I preached a sermon on almost every book of the Bible just to get them accustomed to doing that. Then we dropped into the Gospel of John, took a year through John. Uh, then we kept it at a year and, sh- and shortened the book to Ephesians. I overplayed my hand a little bit doing that. I should have waited another year before I did that. But then I, that got our church accustomed to uh, going through books of the Bible and spending a year or two. So now it's two years per book. Okay, I want to back up. All right. You said I should have waited. First of all, how do you know that? Well, what, that's, that's what told true. you you should have waited? I, uh, maybe uh, the <laughs> the rapid departure of people. Huh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had plenty of that. Yeah. I ran all kinds of people out of the church. Well, and over over that commitment to preaching through books, was that S- it? Some of it. Or? It could be they just didn't like me. I, you know, who yeah. knows? Uh, they were introverts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I come on too strong. I don't know. Uh, I, I had a lot of that go on. I think some of it, too. You get into Ephesians, pretty soon into Ephesians 1, 4, you're dealing with uh, election, uh-huh. and people get nervous. Yeah. It was something new uh, for our church to hear. Yeah, the fact that you were dealing with it at all. At all. What? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, the, a lot a lot would just simply avoid it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're, it's, I'm in it now. I mean, I'm in Romans 8, and uh, just before going into Romans 9 yeah, in a couple that, of weeks. that is true. 9 comes after 8. Oh, I've man. That. Look, I wish it didn't. <laughs> Actually, the truth is, once people get the ethic of, like, yeah, Pastor, yeah. if you show it to us in the Bible, we'll believe it. And I'd say 10 years in, the people that are with you now are there. Our folks have been very kind, honestly, genuinely uh, been very gracious. Well, two things happen. One is uh, people make a decision, am I going to stay with this guy or not? Yeah. And those that don't obviously go somewhere else. But the people who stay, they've reached a settled decision no i i like this this feeds me i, I well i, I hope that's the i case. believe this is i this trusted is you good and then everybody else that comes into the church right. they come in already right. predisposed to be behind you because you're part of their calculation of why they're joining the church honestly we have seen that uh at yeah. our at our north campus uh 51 percent of the people that are attending there now have come in the last 10 years yeah well, and uh, I believe you, you develop, and once people get that taste for the Word of God that's true. and just like they see the way it fits, mm-hmm. that's the thing. They're not, you're not just telling them little Bible stories and pulling stuff out. Right. They're seeing the grand scheme of things. It, but but it, 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 it is an acquired taste. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But uh, it's good for you. No, indeed. And, it, and it does put a pressure on you to be good in the pulpit, doesn't it? I don't know about that. Uh, really? To be good, uh, you do want to be interesting. You want to be faithful. Yeah, that's you want right. to that's be energetic. I mean. You want to be engaging. Well, I'd call that good. Okay. You? Oh, well, yeah, I would. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, though. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, you, what, you can't, what I mean is you can't phone it in. No. And you no. can't just get up and recite Matthew Henry. No, that's right. You, you, right. You've, you've got to be engaging. Uh, I call it thinking on the perceptual level, hmm. where you're not merely thinking the concept, like uh, here's – this doctrine or the content of this verse, you're thinking, okay, how do I say this in a way that grabs them, right? that interests them, that, that pulls them in? Hmm. And I think that's really what good preachers do. Now, I've heard you preach, hmm. and you do that. Oh, good. All right. Yeah, yeah. you think of the perceptual level. <laughs> Tell me about uh, your lovely bride, Connie. Connie LaBelle Smith Presley. I, mar- I met her. I love LaBelle. LaBelle. Connie LaBelle. You know, thankfully, um, she has a grandmother, uh, had a grandmother. Her name was Lily Bell, and her dad wanted to name her Lily Bell, and by God's grace, her mother intervened, and they shortened it to LaBelle. Uh. I've been married to a girl named Lily Bell. <laughs> anyway, her name's Connie LaBelle. Yeah, she'd be worth it. Uh, met her uh, at Southwestern. Wonderful woman. I'd never met a woman like that that was uh, so genuinely Christian, and really uh, fell in love very quickly. Uh, met her, dated her on a January the 11th was our first date. Uh, Easter, I asked her to marry me, and s- September of 92, we were married. That's the way to do it, man. Yeah, it, was, it really was. You're singing for my hymn book there. And honestly, she uh, she's she never raised her voice to me. She's always been... 
kind and supportive. Um, she really is the most patient because I do all kind, all kinds of dumb things, and yeah. she's been so just patient and kind. I wouldn't have the ministry I have if it weren't for Connie, I without believe, question. Yeah, I believe that. You you hear that repeatedly from most. I'm not going to say all, but most pastors I think who have first of all a good relationship with their church. I think it it often grows out of a good relationship with their wife. No, no question. Uh, I make the statement that outside of the Word of God <clears throat> itself, my greatest source of credibility in the church hmm. is my relationship with my wife. I agree. Is that the way it works for I you? I agree, man. My home, I go home, and all the pressures of work and life and church are not there. My home's like a retreat. Yeah, and it makes you joyful. Man, indeed. You know, uh, I've learned that if things are good at home, I mean, really mm-hmm. good, and you're happy, you, you can handle anything else. Just about anything else. But, but if things are bad at home, it doesn't matter how good it is that's anywhere true. else. Yep, absolutely. So the the pastor's home life is so Man, that's significant. True. Hmm. And you have how many children? I have two boys, both of them adopted. Mac and Nate, one is twenty three, and the other is twenty one, and they're they're biological brothers. Not married yet, though. No, neither one. No grandkids mm-hmm. yet? Nope. But I do have them out of the house. <laughs> do you enjoy an empty nest? Man, do I ever. Oh, son. I'm so glad to have those boys gone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what. I cried for 10 minutes when Not they left. Me. No, Cleaned sir, out the I, room through a party. I and... cried for hitting my head on the ceiling for jumping up and down. <laughs> I wasn't crying about them leaving. <laughs> uh, well, um, tell me about, uh, so when you preach through books of the Bible mm-hmm. now, how far in advance do you plan? Like, do you do you break up the whole series? Yeah, I'll break up um, like with Romans. So we took Romans and planned out the entire year um, and gave each Sunday a certain passage so that I would have it laid out for the whole year. And I always know what I'm – so I come in on a Monday, I always know what I'm starting on for that week. Do you use any research assistance or do you just do do everything yourself? I do everything myself. Uh, now, I don't even use a computer. You don't? Uh-uh. I write, handwrite everything, use nothing but books. I don't use a computer at all. Man, I don't even know how that's possible. Really? Oh, yeah. I don't like it. I mean, I just, uh, really. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a big Logos user. Yeah. I got 10,000 books right there on my right, iPad. Look, you know? I know those that do it, love it, and, and, and I get I get this sermon a lot. I reject it. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's uh, so you're a Luddite uh, uh, technologically with, well, now that's with true. preaching. That's true, yeah. Just with, with, with preaching. Uh, so uh, you consult commentaries? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, before or after you do your basic layout the of the Basic uh, layout, basic writing, thinking over, uh, praying through, and just mulling. So I handwrite it all out, and then it starts to break out for me. Oftentimes, you can start seeing it pretty quickly. What's subordinate, uh, where the thoughts are, what words might be worth really tracking down. Do you, so you say you preach from a manuscript? Mm hmm. Uh, how wed to that manuscript are you? Not as much as I once was. I used to be under such a time constraint with the five services that I could not really spare even a, a second minute. So if I had 32 or three minutes, I had to get make sure I stayed with it. I knew exactly how long it took to get through this manuscript. Uh, now I probably import 25, 30% of what I've, of my sermon is probably not scripted. So you're writing <laughs> shorter manuscripts? No, I write, a, I write a full manuscript. Yeah. Will change or ad lib or depart from it while I'm preaching. And then you can pick back up. Yeah, that is right there in front of you. Yeah. Huh. Uh, that's a lot of thinking on your feet. It is, uh, and I don't know if I'm good at it or not, uh, but I, it does happen a lot when I'm preaching. Well, you're comfortable with it. I am comfortable with it. And that, that's significant. Yeah. Now, I'm one of those guys who's, who tells my students, throw manuscripts away. Oh, man. I wish I had known that. I certainly wouldn't have owned up to. Yeah, no, no. Well, uh, uh, here's what I say. Okay. Uh, of course, you know, I don't, I'm not, my word's not infallible here. Mm. I say as good as you are, and mm-hmm. I think you're a really good preacher. I'd say you'd be better without it. You think so? I do. I think if you gave yourself bullet points, okay, 
bullet points, what I call breadcrumbs along the trail. Mm. Just enough to keep yourself on track. All right. What you're saying you're doing now, 25% of the time, I say you should do that, uh, 80%. So even the introduction, nothing, don't write any of it out? Well, uh, you know what you're going to say. Right. But, I mean, how much, how, but how much do you need to write out to say exactly the way you're going to say it? Yeah. You know, I can I can write out uh, The Chosen by Kayan Potok, mm-hmm. and I know exactly what I'm going to do with that. Okay. That that just tells me, oh, yeah, that's that's the thing that goes there. Look, I'll be at the Southern Baptist Seminary in April. Between now and then, I'm going to try that. Okay. All right. Uh, here's the th- It gets down to trust in yourself. Mm. Trust what you have digested. Sometimes, and, though, when I come off script, I say things that I probably shouldn't say. I, I, I find that hard to believe. No, it's true. Well, you know. If you get yourself in trouble, go back to the manuscript, right? Don't blame <laughs> okay, York. Okay, okay. <laughs> what do you do for uh, for fun? All right, man, I don't you know. hesitate. Yeah, right I don't there. know. Uh, like what? What are my suggestions? What are my? Well, options? some guys play golf. No, I don't play golf. Uh, do you? I mean, anything? Anything you would call a hobby? Not really. I like to read at night. Uh, I don't do it. I'm really boring. Genuinely. Yeah, you're really productive too. Now, here's my question: oh. Is do you? Uh, I know you're productive, and I, I think you achieve an awful lot. Do you give yourself enough recreational time? I think so. Um, I like to exercise. Do that early in the morning. Uh, I like to read every night from nine to ten. Uh, we'll read, uh, so I'll close the day out reading. Uh, it feels like you know relaxation. Yeah. Well, again, if it's yeah, if you if it's emotionally satisfying to I you, think I'd so. say that. Take that a day works. off each each week, and yeah. What do you do on your day off? Uh, Connie and I'll do something. Uh, go to lunch or something. She wants to go somewhere. Maybe just hang around the house. Maybe work in the yard. Uh, do you guys travel much? Not much. You know, it's hard to travel with Sunday. You always got to be back for Sunday. Mm-hmm. So maybe someday. So uh, a question I like to ask people, see, Tanya and I are big travelers. Okay. So uh, one thing that helps me see in somebody's mind is like, if you could go anywhere in the world with Connie right now, where would you go? Probably to uh, England, Scotland, Ireland. We've been there before. Really loved it. Yeah. I'd love to spend more time there. I'd like to spend, you know, three or four months there. Yeah. But you know, when you're at a place like England, you're actually learning. You know, you're not you're not going to England to right. to do nothing. I enjoy that, but I also I like the beach thing. You know, I like to go do nothing. Well, now we our vacation is absolutely nothing. Oh, it is genuinely, like we go and sit every single day. I don't get up. I wake up when I wake up on vacation. When my eyes open, spend time with the Lord. Go do some exercise. Go to the beach. Read. When the sun goes down, we'll go back in. Yeah, I like that's that. what we do. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, what books on preaching do you think are are formative in your life? I can't think of any. No, like Lloyd Jones, Stott. I've read you know, them all. I, you know, I've read them all, and they're all good. I don't know any that, that like just changed. Well, who shaped you? Who who made you first see preaching as something you wanted to do? Okay, so I always wanted to be a preacher, but I was a Presbyterian. I didn't want to be that kind of preacher. Uh-huh. There was a PCUSA. Wow. And so I just I knew I didn't want to uh, be that kind of preacher. And I had a friend that lived in Roanoke, Virginia, and went to see uh, her family and went to church at First Baptist Church, Roanoke. First Baptist Church I ever went inside, and the man standing up there had an open Bible and was preaching with such uh, intensity that when we came home, I taught my mom and dad and going to a Baptist church, and there Joe Brown, who was yeah my predecessor, your predecessor at Hickory Grove. was the pastor, and that's what gave me a love for the Bible, well, a love for, the, for preaching the Bible. Now, he, he was not an expositor. I didn't know exposition yet. And uh, when I was in seminary, <coughs> at New Orleans Seminary, 
uh, the first time I ever heard the phrase expository preaching came out of Ted Trailer's mouth. He was preaching in chapel. And uh, his description of what it was and what he wanted to do was what I wanted to do. So once I, once I found out the phrase and what it, what it was, I found a man at New Orleans Seminary. His name is Rick Bowerjohn. He's dead now. In fact, I preached his funeral. He was my Hebrew professor, and he was an expositor. And he's the one that actually taught me what to do with the Bible. But it wasn't a preaching professor. It was a, a Hebrew professor that showed me what to do. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that that was when you were in seminary. Mm-hmm. What, tell me about your college years. You played football, right? Yes, sir. I, I uh, came out of high school, went right to Walford College, and uh, played football there four years. That's and, in Spartanburg? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a one AA school. Uh, and uh, and so were you, were you going to church at that time? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we play on Saturdays, and and if we made it back in time, I got up on Sunday morning, and uh, got dressed and went to church. Baptist church at that point. Oh yeah, at that, that, that point I was already a Baptist. I joined the Baptist church in eleventh grade. Oh, eleventh grade. Yeah, and so by that time I was fully in. Yeah. Well, um, what you what do you mind me asking? How old are you? I'm f- I'll be fifty one next month. You look very young. I do. Yeah, you really do. Man, I don't feel it. Man, I'm, boy. How old are you? I'm, I'll am i be 60 in March. Okay, so the, almost 10 years between us? Yeah, and you look like 20 years younger than me. <laughs> than me so, But you got 10 more years of ministry. Yeah, yeah. well, and I do three things. You know, yeah, so, so that's right. right. That's, that's why it's aging me. Three so. times the man. Uh, what do you, so let's say you've got 20 years of okay. really super active ministry right, left. Right. Let's say that. What do you want those to look like? I'd like the, uh, the the next 10 to look very similar to the last 10. Running, I hope to be able to run uh, at the speed and intensity I've done the last 10. I do want to uh, avoid, if I can, uh, being <clears throat> staying too long somewhere. At a church like Hickory Grove, I think probably there comes a time when it needs a younger man to provide uh, that sort of all-the-time leadership. I don't want to be out of ministry, but I also don't want to be in the way of it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I hope to, to make a wise decision then because I've seen so many that do not. You stay too long. Yeah. And then the guy, young guys come in and clean up a mess or, you know, something like that. Uh, you're exactly right. <laughs> well, if that's looking forward uh, for those years. Tell me what your typical week looks like. So how do you plan out your week? Okay. Uh, it's planned out pretty well. Um, every day is a 5 a.m. day except for uh, Sunday's a 4 a.m. day, and Saturday is no alarm clock. So up at 5, read the Bible till 6.30, 6.30. All my weights are in the backyard. So I got in the backyard, lift weights till about 7.30. Come in, cleaned up, have a protein shake, head into work. I'm at the office by 8.35 or so. And then have the full gamut of meetings and studying and stuff that goes with church. Do that all, all week long. Um, then usually I'm home most nights except for Wednesdays and sometimes Thursdays. And Tuesdays I'll have a school board meeting. Um, and then at 9 o'clock I'll read from 9 to 10.30, go to bed by 11, and then start it over again. Uh, so are you? is that school board? Our school. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're a public school board. No, no, no. Uh, uh, you serve as a trustee of Southern mm-hmm. Seminary. Right. Uh, what's it like being a trustee of a Southern Baptist institution? I mean, it's, I love it. I think it's a lot of fun. Get to be there, get to see how great things are going, get to see people that I respect and admire. I, I love the whole process. Yeah. it's I, I, Honestly, I think Southern Baptists do this well. Yeah, I really do too. You know, I was a trustee of the International Mission Board for eight years. Oh, were you? Tanya's a trustee of NAM. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I think... Our trustees take these things very seriously. No, I do. Yeah, think about it a lot. Yeah. In fact, I'm an officer. Don't forget that part. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to give you that due respect. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, uh, man, it's been a joy to have you on uh, Pastor Well. Like I say, you you are someone I admire greatly. Doctor York, I appreciate that. Thank I you always for enjoy me. being with you. Like well, thank you, say, you. You know, here's one of the things about you, Clint. You're going to enjoy life. You're going to enjoy whatever's going on. <laughs> you're going to have fun. You're right. going to. 
you're going to be happy. Right. You, you're not a guy that gets down much, are you? Not much, no. No. Uh, and the other thing I noticed about you is that whenever you go somewhere, you always take somebody with you. I like to have people, our, our folks with me, yep. Yeah, have and a good time. young men, you're putting your stamp on. Some solid guys. Discipling. Mm-hmm. That's so key. Mm-hmm. So, man, I, I want to thank you. Let me, uh, I like to end with what I call twinkling of an eye around, just ask you some random questions. Okay, do it. And uh, just whatever you want to say. All okay. Right? Yeah, do you have a favorite movie? Uh, yes. What is it? It is The Outlaw Josie Wells, Clint Eastwood. Uh, old school. Mm-hmm. Do you like westerns in general? For the most part, as long as they're not, you know, cheesy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you like spaghetti westerns a lot? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, but they get, you know, kind of boring. <laughs> get long. Eastwood's yeah. got really long. Yeah. Do you st- are you still an Eastwood fan? Yeah. Uh, did you see uh, The Mule? N- uh, yes. Where he, he yeah, true, yeah huh? I did see it, yeah. Uh, he's fascinating to me. Yeah, he really movies. is. Uh, yeah. What he's doing. Um how about secular books that have influenced you? Mostly uh, history and biography. Um, became a real big fan of Theodore Roosevelt. I think he's probably the the greatest sort of, maybe even greatest, greatest American leader we ever had. So that really influenced me. What uh, uh, what preachers have influenced you? Like the, the you listen to say, are there contemporary preachers you listen to? I really don't listen much to uh, preaching. Yeah, I don't. Have, I mean, I'd rather be reading or doing something else. Any podcast you listen to, mm. other than this? Other one? Other than this one, <laughs> I listen to the briefing every morning when I'm shaving, getting ready. Uh, for the most part, I listen to this one some. Uh, I listen to. I don't think I, we we've got a podcast at the church. I don't know that I've ever listened to it. Do Do you discuss your sermons with Connie? Oh yeah. Before or after? Both. Uh, I'm usually writing the manuscript on uh, Saturday evening from 2.30 to about 6.30. I'm writing it out on Saturdays. And then she's cooking. Uh, she'll cook some supper, usually a breakfast. I always have breakfast for dinner on Saturday nights. And then uh, I'll talk to her about it then. And then she rides back and forth with me on Sundays. All right. One final thing. All right. You are impeccable in your dress. But not, nowhere close to you, Dr. York. Oh, let's come be on. honest. Come uh, you you, you come are on. so far beyond anything mm, that I, I have you. ever done. And you just always look super sharp. Well, thank you. What is your favorite brand of shoe? Allen Edmond. Allen Edmond. Not, not only the favorite brand, brand, the only kind of dress shoe. Because they last forever. Now, see, I'm that way with Cole Hans. They're, they're, oh, yeah? They don't hurt my feet. I don't worry about that. It's yeah. better, to, better to look good than to feel good. Okay. You yeah. know, my, my mother's in that camp. That's my mother's <laughs> philosophy. And at 87, she's still wearing high heels. I can appreciate that. Yeah, well, All right. I'll have to introduce you sometime. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Uh, Clint Presley, Pastor Clint Presley, I will say uh, thank you for being on Pastor Well. It's always a joy to be with you. Uh, you encourage me greatly. I appreciate uh, that. I thank God thank for your spirit, your you, leadership, and the way that he's using you. Uh, thanks for tuning in to Pastor Well. I hope that you'll subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. We'll see you again next time on Pastor Well.